Well, good morning, Southside Bible Church. A special welcome to anyone. I'd like to welcome you as well as Robert did. We're glad to have you with us and to worship our God together. We're going to continue now worshiping through the declared Word of God. Um, we've been hiking around the Alps as a church. It's been a hard climb. We were in COVID and studying Romans 1 through 3 in the depth of our sin and the wrath of God being upon us while we were locked in our living rooms. And there was just a, a lot that we have journeyed through Romans. But now we've gotten to chapter 8 and the views are just spectacular. We're looking at a panoramic of history from God's perspective. And the, the creator of it all is revealing his mind and his heart and his purpose to his created ones, as we just saw in Ephesians 1. He's showing us all things that mind or reason could never come up with or ever comprehend. We could have had 10,000, 1,000 lifetimes, and we could have never come up with what we're going to look at this morning or understood it. We were, we were taking it through a fire hose, but I don't think I've ever seen anything as beautiful as Romans 8, 28 through 30. I think God gave me COVID just to bring me back to earth. <laughs> I felt like I was going to disintegrate for all the glory that I was taking in. I was just driving around and meditating and my devotions, and I just can't get over that God set his love on me before the foundational world. So I want you to come on this ride with me, and uh, I, I don't want you to have little thoughts of salvation that, that are as small as, I, I just, I believed in Jesus and that's it, and maybe one day I'll go to heaven. Paul is just ratcheting that up, and he wants you to see the whole picture of salvation, the eternal picture, to show you the greatness of what you have been brought into. And it's way bigger than just, um, I believe in Jesus, and one day I hope to go to a better place. It's just way bigger than heaven will be happy. It's just way too small to, to leave this great of a salvation in those just snapshots. When God has an infinite gift and treasure for us to be done, to just bring us into the fullness of this salvation. And so let's let God teach us about his infinite grace again this morning and that I just pray everyone would be lost in wonder, love, and praise. So let's go to our God and, and continue to worship through this word. Father, I thank you. I thank you for who you are. And I thank you that you have created this world with a purpose to put yourself on display through the gospel of grace. And I thank you that the centering piece of that gospel is Jesus Christ. Lord, we love him. We make much of him. We want to become like him. And so I pray now, just put him on display and let us, give us eyes to see as we read this morning. Let us, by your spirit, comprehend just the beauties and the glories of this gospel. Let us understand the hope that's laid up for us. And so lead us and guide us this morning, we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, our outline that we are working through is Paul gave us four elements to strengthen us uh, in, in our trials. How do we handle and get through the trials of life? We began in verse 28, looking at the certainty of it. Paul says, we know. We absolutely know this is something that the Christian can die on. It's bedrock. You can be absolutely certain that God, the, the extent is that he's causing all things to work together for good. And every one of your lives, there, God, you know, believer, child, he is working everything for your good. There's nothing outside that Greek word, panta, everything. Every detail of your life, God is working for your good. And the recipients are those who have been, who love God and those who have been called of God to this purpose. And now we've been fleshing out what is God's purpose in salvation. And that's the source, the grace of God. And so we've been looking and just seeing this beautiful view of grace, which is strengthening us to be able to be certain that every detail of my life God's working for my good, and, the, and we're, we're defining good even more clear this morning. It's going to be to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, not I'll have more cars and houses and better health. God's working for my good to make me into the image of Jesus Christ. 
And we can, we can die on this and be certain. And that's what we've been working through now. So last week, we began to look at, in verse 29, it's called the, the chain of grace. And I remembered my chain this week. Isn't that beautiful? This, this one is he foreknew. This one he predestined. This one he called us. He justified us and he glorified us. And the, the chances of me tearing this thing apart are zero. And this is the eternal grace of God, these five links in this chain that we're looking at. None of them are us. Or we said that would be the weakest link and the whole thing would snap. The grace of God is every link is what he does. And therefore, it will come to pass. And when you're brought into this first link, you will make it to the last link. So for some of you, that did nothing, but that's exciting. <laughs> I, I like visual. So that was beautiful. And I remembered it. I was so happy. Eric called me, this, texted me this morning and said, don't forget the chain. So it's this guy's, you go pat him on the back. Thank you, Eric, because I, I was going to forget it. So look with me in verse 29. God works all things together for good. For, and that's explanatory now, and he's going to begin to strengthen and undergird. That I, I want us to live such radical lives of trusting God that he's working everything, and that's what we're looking at now. So the first link in this chain is for whom he foreknew. And that was what we looked at all last week, really tr diving into that word and seeing that word for no is this, this intimate connection, relationship, and, and love, and God doing it before, beforehand. And so before he creates the world, God chose to set his love upon you. That's what brings you into this chain of grace. As it's, so, it's, it's so big. It started before eternity passed that, that God already had his, his affection set upon you. I don't know how you get over that. I don't know how you walk around frowning. That if God loves you, what more do you want out of anything? <laughs> he set his love on you. That's better than, than anything this world could ever offer. God set his love on you, believer. <clears throat> so the first link in the chain is he foreknew. Jeremiah said, he has loved me with an everlasting love. Therefore, he has drawn me. He's drawn me to himself. First Thessalonians 1 4 says, Knowing, brethren, beloved of God, his choice of you. He chose you because he loved you. 2 Thessalonians 2 13, we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation. And so he, he loved you and he chose you from the beginning. Ephesians 2, 4, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. 1 John 3, 1, see how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. And such we are. What a love. I love that hymn, oh, oh love that will not let me go. It's eternal. And you have been brought into it by the grace of God alone. So this morning, we're going to begin to look at why this is such a great love. What's so special that God has set his love upon his people? And we'll see that when God loves someone, he expresses it really well, <laughs> really well. Like, it's unbelievable how God expresses his love. It's not a passive love. It's the most glorious, active, accomplishing love that will ever be known. I really don't think any truth could contain more richness and blessing to us than the simple phrase, God loves me. We will seek to grow in understanding that and all of its ramifications for the rest of our lives and the rest of eternity. I look forward to it. So what does God do when he sets his love upon us? Look with me in verse 28, 29. <clears throat> For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. And so God's love, it's not a passive uh, emotion, but it's an act of volition. It moves him to determine the highest blessing that he can communicate 
to his loved ones. Because he set his love on you, he's now going to predestine to, to give you the fullness of all of his love. He's, he's determined it, uh, predestined it. What, what could be the highest blessing that you could ever get? Look at all the blessings of what God could give to his beloved children. What is it? When in our text, is to become conformed to the image of his son. So if God loves you, his love is going to be expressed by predestining you to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Can you think of anything better than that? Throw it out. I'll, 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 I'll stomp it. <laughs> There's nothing better. Ask yourself, what would be the greatest blessing God could give you? What's the sunum bonum, bonum of all blessings, the highest of every blessing? It's conformity to Jesus Christ. Oh, that we could learn to love like God. What he pours out on those he loves is absolutely amazing. I love you. I'm going to conform you to the image of my son. It's so full and beautiful and lavished for our good. It's safe and it's protective and it's sacrificial and it gives. And this is how I'm to love my wife, how I'm to love every one of you and everyone in this world. I want their conformity to Christ. That's the highest end that love can ever reach to. Do I love anyone? I want their conformity to Christ. That's going to be the measuring stick if I love anybody. I want to see you look like Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be conformed to the image of Christ, to love like this. And I keep bringing you back to Romans 8, 4, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. What it would be like to perfectly love God and love others. Well, this is what heaven is going to be like. This is going to end in glorification. And we're going to love like this forever. So please get this. God doesn't leave this in uncertainty. I love them so much. I just hope that they'll let me love them. I hope that they'll choose me. I hope that they'll take this salvation. No, I will send my son into this world to die for them. And, and after that death, I just hope they'll accept it. God's love is just too great, guys for that. God's love takes you up. It doesn't respond to your love. It acts. Love acts and it moves out and it comes to bless you. God's love will do all that is necessary for you to bask in his infinite love for all of eternity. So because of his love for us, he predestined us to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a love that God has for his people. One pastor said, the aim of predestination as it related to our good is that we're appointed to share the very glory of the risen Christ, both morally and blameless righteousness, and physically in a resurrection body of glory like his own. That's love. And I'm going to spend the rest of my sermon trying to unpack that infinite truth. So let's get ready, if you'll, if you'll work with me. Predestined. He predestined. Two words again. The first one is pro, and it means before. And then harizo, destined. That's where we get the word horizon. Horizon, is a, it's a dividing line that marks off what we can see and what we can't see. And so God predestined <clears throat> by putting the ones that he foreknew in a marked off area. And the picture, if you could look at a circle, is he mapped out a certain destination for them, pro, before, before the foundation of the world. First Peter 2.9, you're a chosen, a peculiar race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession you might proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You're a chosen special possession, and he's mapped off a special blessing 
for these ones. He's predestined them for something really special because he loves them. And he puts them within this circle, this golden chain of his saving graces, his purposes. The word predestination from this, one of the best lexicons out there, Bag, Bauer, Art, and Gingrich means to decide upon beforehand, to determine a, a person's destiny beforehand. And again, I know that doesn't fit with modern Christianity, but we hold it up to the scriptures. And as Robert read in Ephesians 1.5, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ himself, according to the kind intention of his will. And then in verse 11, we've obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. So what did God predestine us to? What did he mark us off for? What did he determine beforehand for us? What, what did his love for us cause him to determine for us? And it's important now to look at this, look at what Paul's doing here is for new, predestined, called, justified, glorified. It's just a great chain. I love it. But all of a sudden here in verse 29, he breaks the chain. He, he throws in some explanation. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined what? To become conformed to the image of his son so that we would be the firstborn among many brethren. Why break the chain? Paul, what, what would cause you to pull out of the chain and bring these explanations? It has to be important to break a chain like that. And this shows how important it was to Paul. What we're going to look at this morning is just precious gold to pull out and explain these to become conformed to the image of his son. God created us. Let us make man in our image. And then Adam sins, and he takes the whole human race with him, we saw in Romans 5. Our earthly image is now we're sin-marred creatures instead of being image bearers of God. And now we all derive our image from Adam, who sinned in the likeness of his offense, according to Romans 5. And so there was great loss in the garden. I don't long for the fruit trees and just walking in a peaceful garden. We lost the image of our maker. We're marred and we're, we're used for sin now. Our mind, affections, and will that once uh, imaged God now is darkened. Uh, the affections are for this world and the will is enslaved to do the will of the devil. <laughs> we were made to reflect God and have fellowship with him. And now we defame him and we reflect the devil more than God. We're pure evil in our land who were once image bearers of God. That should break your heart. You were made to worship God and this world is worshiping everything other than God this morning. All the rest of the curse that was given would be light if we still had the image of God. God has predestined us to something beyond comprehension. He's predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. And I want you to catch this, not the image of Adam. A million times more than what we lost in the garden, we get back. And we're going to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That's what he's predestined us for. The image renewal begins at salvation. And God begins to renew us back into his image from one degree of glory to the next. And Paul is here pointing to that great time in history when mortality will put on immortality and we're going to be like him in eternal glory. We're going to shine like the sun. What we lost in Adam, we get back a hundredfold in Christ. He will make me like Christ. We will be conformed like him bodily and spiritually. And we will be in the image of his perfect holiness, outward and inwardly perfect. And so I get excited about no more sin. What a promise. But how about the positive side? No more sin, and I'm going to shine and radiate like Jesus Christ forever. I'm going to be conformed to his image. And this isn't like some coin, like Lincoln's on a, a penny. That's the likeness of Lincoln, but it's still a penny. I'm going to conform. The Greek word means to make you like something. 
an inward likeness and conformity, not just on the surface, from the very inside to the outside, I'm going to conform you to the image of my son, a likeness and essence. We're going to shine and emanate Christ likeness. And we're going to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and our neighbor as ourself. And one note is we won't be God. We will be like him in holiness and purity. We are not the firstborn, the only begotten. We are adopted and we will be conformed to the image of Christ. Christ is the image of God. He came to this earth. He exegeted him. He said, I'm the exact representation of my father. And you're going to be made innately and perfectly like Christ. We'll be conformed into all of that likeness. So now you see why John said, see how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we shall be. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. When we see him, we're going to become like him. And so one day, we're going to be perfectly conformed to Jesus Christ. Do you see that the purpose of salvation, it's bigger than just the forgiveness of my sins. It's bigger than just justification. It's bigger than just sanctification. You've been predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ forever. That's where all of history is moving. And because God set his love on you, you're on that train, that train that's going to bring you to glory. And in the meantime, God causes all things to work together for good. The fashioning has begun. Don't despise it. Don't despise a God who is shaping you into the image of Jesus Christ. And, and you know the, the one tool that doesn't work very well? Ease, comfort, no struggles, no trials. That's usually not the best way to conform someone to Jesus Christ. At times, it can. But his, what I've seen in my journey, his number one instrument is sticking you in the furnace. And there's always a purpose and there's always a reason because he loves you. And he is committed to make you into the image of Jesus Christ. No one sits in the furnace this morning for no reason. You sit in it because the love of God is committed to make you into this image. We must be the envy of the angels. They will never be conformed to the image of Christ. Charles Spurgeon said they would give up being in the very presence of God, the golden streets, all that they have now, if they could trade places with us and one day be made into the likeness of Jesus Christ. So can you get your arms around this? This love reaches into eternity past. It continues to eternity future. It's greater than all my sin. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. It secures me so that nothing can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And it's predestined me to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ so it will come to pass. Whatever God predestines will happen. <laughs> Smile. Some of you look like you ate some bad cereal. I want to make some application just right now. I can't wait to the end. It needs to be done. <clears throat> should not our ambition then be the ultimate end of God's decree. We're not just predestined to go to heaven. So many think that that's all it is and we're going to be happy there just meandering our lives away awaiting until we go to heaven. That's a grave mistake. That's to miss what all of history is about. Where God is moving all this it's conformity to his son. And so this can't be trivial to us this morning. It must be the highest desire of our souls because it's the highest desire of God's heart. It's got to be your chief end. 
I, I, I join God in, in mind, heart, and soul to move in the end which he has predestined me to because he loves me. I wanna, I'm, I'm on God's side. I, I'm, where, where you're wanting to take me is where I want to go. You've changed my heart, my desires. I want conformity to Christ. My whole life, I just want to keep moving in the direction of looking like Jesus Christ. Conformity to this world. Paul's going to say in chapter 12, don't be conformed to this world. It's the lowest end. It's against all that God's doing in your life. Trying to, if you're being conformed to the world, it's against everything that God is wanting to move and direct your life into. <laughs> this is a call to discipleship. This is to give your life to walk as Jesus walked on this earth. To be conformed to his image. To be what you have been made to be. So if this is the chief end of God, to undo this whole curse that has marred us in the image of God, to from one degree of glory to another, to conform us into the image of Christ, the question has to be answered. Now you need to answer this I don't care if you're five, however old you are this morning, you've got to answer this before God. Is your life seeking to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ? Or are you just in this for your comforts and your ease and what you can drink up in this world? What is your purpose? It's got to be answered. And I just want to rip away everything that's being conformed to the world this morning, saying, God, open their eyes. Show them your chief end is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And to answer honestly, is that your chief end? Or is your whole life, how do I just make it easy? Are you just lukewarm, waiting for heaven? But Jesus says, I want to spit it out of my mouth. What's your chief end? Will you receive difficulties and trials and struggles because that is God's chief instrument in conforming us to Christ to fill up his sufferings, to learn obedience from the things that he suffered. Will you just talk about Christianity and every time something hard comes, throw them away? Or will you say, God causes all things to work together for good because he's predestined me to be conformed to Jesus Christ, so he's going to bring everything into my life unto that end and that purpose. And there, there has to be a point in a Christian life when you finally say, uncle, a glad surrender. God, here's my life. Whatever it takes to conform me to the image of Christ, I open. Instead of fighting them all of your life. That's what's before us this morning. It's going to conform you and teach you how to truly love God and love others. You're going to get tested and stretched beyond your capacities. You're going to have uh, long haulers COVID for 11 months and get nailed again. God, teach me to be like Jesus Christ and to trust you. You're going to get hit in a million different ways. And we live in a country that preaches that God doesn't want that for you if he really loves you. He wants to keep us from these things, but your free will can't stop it. That's a sham. It's a sham. Step into Romans 8.28 this morning. There's a God who's going to use everything that he's predestined to conform you to Christ. You're going to have loved ones walk away and children and lose jobs, and you're going to go through so many things. God's promised it because he loves you. Don't let trials come and say, does God love me? He loves me, and he's predestined these things to conform me and to shape me to the image of Christ. That's the love of God. He foreknew you. Thank you, God. Those he doesn't discipline, he does not love. Hebrews 12. This is how you know Romans 8, 28 is happening in your life. <clears throat> Everything, all things to conform you to Christ that God predestined you would become. Marvel, worship, and be amazed at what you've been brought into. 
You've been brought into this chain. And I'm telling you now, every trial, you don't have to fear. It's handpicked. The intensity, how long, duration, every bit of it is a love gift from God to conform you to his image. And this is the opposite of the junk we hear all the time on the TVs. Spit it out. God didn't save you to give you an easy, comfortable health, wealth, and prosperity life. He saved you to predestine you, conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. This has taken over my heart. Conformity to Christ is my goal and my ambition now, not the American dream. I want to be conformed to Christ. Have you gotten lost in the American dream this morning? Some of you are sitting here right now and you're lost in it. All you want to do is get married and have 3.2 kids and a house in Denver, which is next to impossible. Go shoot for a basement now. Get a dog and a cat. Just want a career. Just life in America is really my highest end. Not conformity to Jesus Christ. You got to deal with that this morning before the one who says, I know your heart. It's got to be addressed. Salvation is on the line. This is what salvation's goal and what you've been predestined for. And what is it that will make you the happiest of all? This. This. When you, get, when you see yourself being conformed to the image of Christ, there's nothing sweeter in this world. It tastes better than anything I've ever eaten and I've eaten in a lot of restaurants. There's nothing more satisfying to the believer than when you see characteristics of Jesus beginning to blossom up into your life. That's what the body of Christ is for to help each other in the journey that God has placed us on. And if you've been rocked to sleep in God's chief end for your life, I want you to wake up this morning and be sober and be alert and run the race that's been set before you. In all sincerity, do you bear more of the marks of Christ in your life than when you first believed? Did somewhere in the journey you lose what I'm talking about this morning and you have an apathetic Christianity that's taken over you? Maybe a cultural Christianity that I saw come out the last year and a half? Just a lukewarmness? Did you lose what this is all about somewhere? Being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ? Did you lose it in ministry? Have you lost it in life and the trials? Have you lost your chief end? Is this grace conforming you to the image of Christ? Is it? Go ask your wife if you have one. Go ask your children. Go ask your friends. Make this your end. This is the proof if you've been called of God. I just don't see enough people hungering and thirsting for righteousness, but happy to just learn how to be nice Christians and live nice lives. Friends with nice people who vote the same way. I want to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That's what God's predestined me for and has called me to. Thank you. And then it goes higher. <laughs> I don't know how. Look with me in verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to what? to be conformed to the image of his son so that he, Jesus, would be the firstborn among many brethren. <laughs> There's an end more ultimate than the glorification of God's people, if you can imagine that. Concerned with, with glorifying the son of God. The father loves his son. John 17, 24 Father, Jesus said, I desire that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, in order that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou didst love me before the foundation of the world. The love that the Father has for the Son is infinite. And so God the Father 
and his infinite love for his son made him preeminent. He's the head of the church. He's the head over all. And he's the firstborn. This refers to a special place of privilege. The word reflects more on the priority or the supremacy of Christ. It draws out his, his position. He is exalted as Lord over all. And the Father has prepared for him, this beautiful Jesus, a bride from every tribe, tongue, and nation that sits here this morning. <clears throat> and he set his love upon these ones. And he marked them off. And he predestined them that they would be conformed to the image of his son. And these ones are going to be brought into this wedding feast on the last day. The new heaven and the new earth made perfect. And the bridegroom is going to enter the great head. And the full body of Christ will be made perfect and complete. And we're going to glory in Christ perfectly for all of eternity. In this, the Father will be glorified. He creates a plan to exalt all of his attributes and the grace of God. And we, the redeemed church of God, are the manifestation of all of God's greatness and glorious attributes and his, uh, his gracious salvation. And he's going to give a gift for the son, the firstborn. And we're to be little mirrors that reflect his glory. That is what our eternal glory is going to be built upon, just reflecting back to Jesus, him, for all of eternity. Jonathan Edwards said, the infinite happiness of the Father consists in the enjoyment of his Son. And oh, how he will enjoy the Son at that great exaltation when the head uh, of, the, of the church, the glorified church, is so pleased with his Son that he will always be the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. He is the high expression of the love of God and the fountain of all of our love. And so I don't want you to miss the beauty of what we got before us. How do we know that God will work all things together for our good? How do we know that? The answer, God set his love on you. God has a purpose for us and he's called us into it. And it was formed in eternity past to conform us to the image of his son, Jesus Christ, so that we would be the wedding gift for his son on that last day. A bride made perfect and spotless and holy. And every wedding is a little picture of that. And so if we don't make it to glory, God's purpose to give Christ this gift fails. We, we will make it to glory. That he might be the firstborn among many, many brethren, all the elect of God. And so the foundation of our calling is the purpose of God to have a people who will be like Jesus and will exalt him as supreme for all of eternity. And so our calling is as sure as God's ultimate purpose to glorify his son. He's not going to lose any of you because the glory of the Son is at stake. You're in the chain. So will God work all things for good to bring us to glory, to bring us to that climactic finish of history? Yes. The foundation of his love for his Son says yes. I want to read you a couple verses and we'll close out. Colossians 1.16, For by him Jesus... All things were created both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created by him and for him. John 6, 37, Jesus says, All that the Father gives me shall come to me, all who I foreknew. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. Anyone who comes to Jesus, I'll never cast you out. For I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, my father, that of all that he's given me, I lose nothing, but raise him up on the last day. No one will fall out of this chain. I'll lose none of them. I will raise him up on the last day. So Christ will lose none. 
and we will worship him forever as our great head. In Revelation 4.10, in heaven, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne, Jesus, and will worship him who lives forever and ever, and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, worthy are thou, our Lord, and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou didst create all things, and because of thy will they existed and were created. I want you to hear, just close with a quote. As a belief in the Father has reconciled to us in Christ is the most effectual means to destroy the natural enmity of our hearts against him, so also an increasing knowledge of his love and grace and mercy and all their freeness and eternity and immensity only can engage our hearts to him and make his company above all things desirable and his presence delightful. We cannot walk with him in love and confidence till we know his heart is disposed towards us, until we are convinced that it contains grace and mercy more immense than all of our sin and guilt and love infinitely surpassing our unworthiness. And that's what Romans has been about, is to show you that your sin was great and grace swallowed it up. And now the love and mercy of God, you stand in grace. And that subdues your heart. So now all I want to do is know him and walk and become like him. And so I, I pray that you are overwhelmed that in eternity past, when God set his love on you, he marked you off to be conformed to the image of his son. And how is he going to do that? That's what we'll look at next week. We're going to take on three of them, called, justified, and glorified. And I want you just to marvel at the beauty of grace. So to God be the glory that his love works and his love has predestined us to be conformed to the image of Christ. We're a motley crew, man. And one day we are going to shine like Jesus Christ. And so we have such a blessed hope and all these trials are working for our good to shape and to mold us. That's what this life is about. And so I want you to open your hand to a loving God who is doing what he predestined and what's going to be for your ultimate good. Praise God that he afflicts us. If he just left us alone, man, we would, we would not be conformed to the image of Christ. So thank you, Father. Lord, we come before you. How can we ever thank you enough? I can't even go back to eternity past but your word reveals at that time you set your love upon us, your children. What a gift. Let every heart be overwhelmed with that. If God loves us, who could be against us? If God loves us, it brings us into the chain of, of golden grace. And then, Lord, your love acts and starts by predestining us to be conformed to the image of Christ. And Lord, what you predestine, you will bring to pass. And we're going to look next week at the beautiful way that you bring this to pass. God, I thank you that you sent your son into the world and how you can now bring this to pass. It, it cost you your son's life, the wrath of God bearing down upon him as a bullseye. God, what amazing love. And I pray that our hearts would be overwhelmed this morning. And Lord, let every heart join you in your chief end. God, may the rest of our days on this earth be centered on the main thing. I want to be conformed to Jesus Christ. I want to think, walk, speak, love the way he did. I want to speak truth against this world the way that he did. Oh God, we want to walk as Jesus Christ modeled for 33 years on this earth. I thank you that you've recorded it for us. And so, God, do your work in each and every heart. I pray that even this morning, Lord, this work begins when you work on a heart and you show them their guilt of their sin before a holy God and a God who has to punish that sin. And so you put your own son on a cross and punished him in their place. God, let that melt hearts this morning and let them this morning believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ his work, his doing, and let them be saved and begin this glorious conformity to Christ. 
So I pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.